Thanks. Thank you, everyone. How is everybody? Everyone's well? Yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, Kevin and Anne, and of course, Tabor, for hosting the talk today. Um, of course, the, uh, the topic is the Council of Nicaea, and I'll explain what that means, because even that uh, can be a little bit confusing. So I'm going to go across to the next slide. And just a bit of background about myself first. So I'm not a theologian. I'm a, I'm a lay person. So I am not going to come at it from a sort of theological perspective. I'm just going to try and keep it uh, relatively objective and just try and give uh, facts. I'm sure my Eastern Orthodox bias will probably sneak in here and there, and you guys can, uh, you guys can catch me out. How does that sound? Um, and every now and then, I'm going to probably ask for a bit of a thumbs up from you guys just to make sure that you're understanding what I'm saying, because there's a lot of uh, strange words and strange names, strange places. Um, so I'll go, does that all make sense? And you go, sweet, yeah. <laughs> um, so the main aim, again, is to give an objective commentary on the Council of Nicaea. Um, hopefully we'll be dispelling a few bizarre misconceptions that have been um, coming around in the 21st century. I think the format is for us to have about a 45 to 50 minute talk here. Then there'll be some coffee and tea breaks um, before a bit of a, a round table discussion for 50 minutes and that's where you'll have a chance to ask some questions. So I'm sure they'll come up as we go along. If you've got something super duper urgent that you just can't get through, stick your hand up and I'll try and address it. But hopefully later on in the, in the talk, I'll address it or we can talk about it in that next 50 minutes. How does that sound? Cool. So I'm going to try and keep it pretty light in a lot of ways and I'm going to stick to um, slides that don't have massive chunks of text. So you won't have to read too much, but you will have to listen to my slightly nasally voice. Does that sound like a plan? All right, so I'm actually going to step through um, what is meant by the Council of Nicaea. And I will note that sometimes you'll see some different spellings of it, and that's because it's a Greek, uh, a Greek place back in the day, and it's now a Turkish place, and there's been some transliteration. So you might see it spelt um, without an extra A or, or something like that, but it's all the same thing. Um, I'm going to break down what is meant by the first ecumenical council of the church at Nicaea, which is a bit more of a full title for what, what we're talking about here. Um, essentially, it's a, you know, it's a council, it's a, it's a meeting, but we should probably have a quick chat about what is meant by the church. So obviously, we're talking about a Christian gathering here. Um, this is something that happened in 325 AD, so relatively soon after the time of Christ. And when we say the church, essentially what I'm talking about is Christians of the day. And those are people who believed in Christ, Jesus as being their, their Lord, as someone that uh, died and rose again. Um, and, they, and they see their religion as a continuation and a fulfillment of um, you know, Judaism, which goes back much further. Um, the idea behind the word ecumenical sort of just means universal, and the idea behind that is that um, people from all areas of, of Christendom at the time were represented at this council. So sometimes you'll hear about ecumenical movements and things like that, and that's the idea of that today is to try and bring denominations that have split back together. So that's that, that term. It's a bit of a, a strange one. But what it means here is that the universal church, it means all of the Christians. Does that sort of cover that a little bit? All right. It's probably worth noting that there's been quite a few of these ecumenical councils. So um, some denominations today actually recognize more than 15 of them. What you'll find is that the first seven are probably the most important in the sense that they happened when the church was, in a way, one. So there wasn't this sort of break off of denominations that we see today. It's before the, what we call the Great Schism, which is where the sort of East and West, Western churches broke in 1050-ish. There were obviously some small splinter groups and some sects that were going around during that first thousand years, but for the most part, um, uh, there was representation, there was sort of a bit more unity. 
And so a lot of um, denominations today actually will say something in their official documentation about them accepting the first seven ecumenical councils. Um, and then some have more and some have less. Uh, some place greater importance on them than others. So more mainline denominations such as Anglicans, Lutherans, Catholics, Orthodox, they're, they're a bit more focused on it. I know I've, I've seen Baptist churches sort of mention them but not really uh, too much about it. Um, the other one that's probably worth keeping in mind is the, the second council, which is the first council of Constantinople, and that's going to come up later. And the reason for that is that one of the main things that we hear about today when it comes to the Council of Nicaea is the Nicene Creed. And in actual fact, the, the creed that we sort of say in churches today is sort of an updated version of the Nicene uh, Creed that was done at the Council of Constantinople. So it's, sometimes it's called the Nicaea-Constantinopolean Creed. So we'll, we'll come to that down the track. So hopefully everyone's pretty cool with what's sort of meant by an ecumenical council. Um, I didn't want to brush over it because it's a bit of a strange term. Just uh, have a look now at where Nicaea actually is. So I've got two maps there. Um, one's a little bit more zoomed in than the other. So on the left-hand side, we can sort of see where it is relative to uh, the world. So we're talking about what is in today modern Turkey. At, I can use my little pointer, can't I? Is that that red one there? There we go. So obviously you've got modern day Turkey sort of to the right there, and then you've got you know, um, the rest of Europe across there with Greece and Italy and all the rest of it. And then the map on the right shows a bit more of a zoomed in version of it, and you can see the place called Nicaea on what is now a lake called Lake Iznik. So like I was saying before, there's often multiple names for these sorts of things. So back in, in the days of the council, this was under the Roman Empire, it would have had a Greek name, which is Nicaea. But today, because it's in modern day Turkey, it's got a Turkish name. So it's called Iznik and it's on a lake there. So I think you can go and visit, apparently it's nice, but I haven't had the uh, the luxury of being able to go there, but uh, one day I'd like to. We all together? Good. <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to give a really brief historical context for the Council of Nicaea and uh, the sort of background of why it, uh, why it kind of took place, I guess. Um, so Perry Forrester, I think was, was her name, she'd done a, um, a talk a few months ago on Constantine the Great, and that is a good uh, lecture that I encourage you to go back and look at because it kind of sets the context really well because um, up until, you know, around this time, Christianity was actually illegal. So it kind of, you know, been birthed out of Jerusalem and everything that had happened there. And, um, you know, the Romans were, were sort of crushing it. They didn't want it, um, uh, and it was illegal. But in 313 AD, under, Rome, under the emperors Constantine and Licinius, they actually agreed to make it legal. And this is known as the Edict of Milan. Now, I will point out that they didn't make that the state religion at the time. All they did was just say it's not illegal anymore. Does that, that make sense? That's an important distinction. And it's actually not until 55 years after the Council of Nicaea that we had the Edict of Thessalonica, which is where... Um, it became the state religion. Um, so there's a depiction of Constantine the Great, as uh, us Orthodox would probably call him. Um, obviously, who knows what he looked like. So the council was called by Constantine the Great in 320 AD, and um, it was sort of towards the end of his life. Um, if you recall the lecture from Perry, he'd sort of won his war with Maxentius, um, he had the Battle of Melvian Bridge where he adopted the Cairo. Um, so I've got some pictures there because Kevin said, make sure you got pictures. So uh, here we go. We've got the, the Kiru, which is basically, you know, it's the, it's the Greek C-H-R-O for Christ. Um, and then as the story goes, uh, Constantine's troops put that symbol up on their shields and, and won the day against, uh, against quite a few odds and against his... Um, his opposition. So pretty important battle. Um, Perry does a good job of explaining the context and the build-up to that. 
Um, but the important thing is that um, at that point, Constantine said he saw this sign in the sky. He told his troops to put it on their shields. They won the day. Something bizarre definitely occurred, and, uh, and away we go. Does that, that sound good? So in terms of attendees, and this is pretty important, Constantine um, did invite pretty much everyone under his Roman Empire. So it's important to know that, you know, that was kind of the known world at the time, and Christianity was sort of organised into centres of power more so than, say, having a pope or something like that. So there was, uh, you know, a centre in Alexandria in modern-day uh, Egypt. There was one in Antioch, one in Jerusalem, one in Constantinople, and one in Rome. And um, those bishops were quite well honoured, and uh, they would have had sort of jurisdiction over their areas, but there wasn't any kind of one pope that ruled them all or anything like that. So that's an important distinction. That's something that happens after the Great Schism and is kind of part of the reason for it. Um, but I won't let my orthodox broken heart go down that road <laughs> tonight. Um, now, my understanding is, and I'm going to talk briefly about the, um, the sources for, for this information, but my understanding is that even Delix came from as far as Britain, because that was part of the Roman Empire at the time. So that's something interesting for us as uh, Australians, you know, we've, uh, coming from, from Britain. Um, the Roman Empire was there, and so Christianity was there. And um, some of the important patriarchs of these areas were, were in attendance. So we've got Alexander of Alexandria, uh, uh, Estimatius of Antioch and Mercurius of Jerusalem. And I've got a little note down there to discuss a little bit of church history, so that's the spiel. Okay. Now, I'll just delve quickly into the reasons why Constantine called the, the, uh, the council. Um, obviously, he wanted a unified empire. So he wanted to make sure that uh, he had a lot of Christians under his his uh, jurisdiction, and there was some infighting in discussions going on, and he wanted to make sure that uh, everyone was, was unified and that the church had a sort of set position so that there wouldn't be infighting. Because just like any good ruler, they don't want internal weakness because then that makes them subject to attacks from the outside. Uh, hopefully that, that sort of makes sense. Um, for the church itself... They wanted to settle what we call a Christological issue, which is sort of like a theological issue about the nature of Jesus Christ and whether he was actually God and what his relationship to the Father was. And um, at the time, there was something called the um, Arian controversy. So there was a, a priest, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, who had a bit of a different view about um, uh, Christ, sort of saying that he was not... Uh, co-eternal with the Father, essentially not God in the same way that the Father is. Um, and, um, you know, he's possibly created something like that. And that's part of what the fight was about. And when I say fight, I mean a, more of a discourse than a punch-up. Is that okay? <laughs> Although I can't say that uh, whether Arius got punched at this council or not, but there's, <laughs> there's, one, there's one sort of later depiction of him getting, uh, getting sort of socked in the face. Um, the other, the other issue was that there wasn't actually a set uniform date for Easter. And this is because um, some of the church was following the Jewish tradition on, on when Passover was and when the full moons happened and some weren't. Um, and I'm going to go into that. Um, the other thing was that there were some church laws that needed to be established and they've done that as well in this council. And then ultimately what came of it was what we, what we know of as the Nicene Creed. And that's actually more in response to the second issue than anything else. So that's sort of addressing the uh, Arian controversy. Is everyone with me? Excellent. <laughs> All right. Now, I'm not going to read out these huge chunks of text, but um, I did want to look through the sources for the council um, and where, why we know what happened, essentially. Um, so there's a couple of important documents uh, throughout history that sort of refer to the council, uh, one of them being something called the Life of Constantine by uh, Eusebius, and um, this was something that Perry mentioned as well. So 
he obviously had his reasons for writing about the council. He said that he was in attendance. He wanted to keep Constantine on his side. Um, and there's a whole story with him about, you know, whether what he wrote was very accurate or not, or was just painted a picture for him to look good. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, there, are, there is some information in there, such as the letters inviting all of the bishops to the council and things like that, that survived through his works. And so in that sense, he's helpful. So obviously, I've got a, I've got a letter there and I can show you it later about, um, you know, Constantine inviting all of the bishops to come and, and come in unity and, and join together. Um, and there was a letter that Constantine sent after the council to the rest of the church because not everybody attended. And I'm just going to skip through this a little bit. But, because it's just, it's like this letter, like, it's beautiful language, but given we've only got 50 minutes, I don't think I'll sit there and read them out. No, so there's another one where he sent, he sent a, Constantine sent a letter to the Church of Alexandria specifically, and then he sent out one a bit more general. So there's three letters, really, the invitation, one to Alexandria, and one to everyone. So that's what those three slides were. Um, but what I will mention also is that there's another, um, another document from Socrates of Constantinople. It's got to be one of my uncles, right? It's got to be, yeah? <laughs> In fact, my surname, Stambulidis, is uh, the man from Istanbul. And there's a whole story about Constantinople and Istanbul and all that. But... Um, I'm going to use my beautiful pronunciation and, uh, and pronounce his work as the Historia Ecclesia, which is the church history uh, document that he wrote. Um, so this is a source of information that kind of covers the history of Christianity from about 305 AD to 439, and so that includes the council. Um, and some say that it was to continue the work of uh, uh, Eusebius. Um, We've got some English translations off of some old codexes, and some of this stuff exists in the British Museum, some of it exists in Paris. And I do recommend going to the British Museum and to, and to the Louvre, and because they've got um, uh, papyri of the Bible and all sorts of things, um, not to mention our Greek Elgrin marbles, I have to stick that one in. <laughs> but they're a very good source of information. So now to the misconceptions, this is the kind of uh, fun part. All right, so hopefully this will get your, your juices flowing a little bit. Um, so some of these weird misconceptions have come up. I've heard that it's, some of them have come from Dan Brown's books, The Da Vinci Codes, and all sorts of crazy ideas. Um, there's been some, obviously, some debates between Christians and, and non-Christians, and people are bringing up these sort of strange misconceptions about the council. Um, so I've kind of put them in question form, I guess. Um, one of them was, didn't uh, Constantine sort of direct and control the decisions of the council? You know, was the doctrine of the Trinity first discussed and decided at the council? Um, wasn't biblical canon, that means the books that make up the New Testament, decided by Constantine and the bishop at Nicaea? Didn't Constantine burn books of the Bible he didn't want in the Bible? Um, and was the idea that Jesus is divine um, invented or first discussed at Nicaea? So these are just some of them. I know there's some other bizarre ones kicking around. If there's any, or any out there that you'd like to bring up or discuss, please let me know. I'll try my best to, to uh, assuage your, your fears. So I'm going to try and work through each of them, um, mindful of the time. So as I discussed, Christianity was a legal for the first 300 odd years. Um, Constantine didn't instantly become Christian and turn the entire um, country or the entire empire Christian just at the Battle of Melvian Bridge. He continued to use coins and imagery that affiliated him with the old pagan Roman cults like Sol and Viticus, which is the unconquered son. Um, so what Constantine did do though was that he was there to ensure civil order. So he wanted to make sure that the empire was unified. He wanted to quell unrest. And, these, and he wanted to make sure that everyone celebrated Easter at the same time, which was back then a lot more important to Christians than, say, um, Christmas, which is a whole other, <laughs> whole other topic, right? You guys with me? Excellent. 
Um, so there was a few theological issues going on. He sent a bishop from modern-day Spain to try and sort it out, but it didn't work. So then he decided to summon this massive council. And so that's where we got the Council of Nicaea. I'm going to touch on his role a little bit later when we talk about the, the books of the Bible and the Trinity and all sorts of things. Um, what he also did was he, travel, he covered travel expenses, which is really nice, a bit like my company today. <laughs> I was actually in Melbourne this morning, and uh, with the strong winds, I almost didn't make it here, but uh, here I am. Uh, he would have covered things like the hall, the travel, accommodation, these sorts of things, and they would have come out of the Roman public funds. So that's really interesting. Um, but the sources do discuss him actually taking a back seat once the theological stuff ramped up. Um, because he would have had absolutely no theological knowledge, really. He, he would have been, you know, nowhere compared to these bishops. Um, and what happened eventually was that the other bishops um, pronounced uh, Arius and his teachings to be anathema, which is sort of like um, heretical. Uh, they formulated the creed and these sorts of things. So Constantine um, sort of went with that and respected their decision and... Um, pronounce a civil exile to him as well. But it's important to note that there was no violence, that like his troops weren't there enforcing things and um, Arius wasn't killed or anything like that. Um, and he did not invent the Trinity or talk about New Testament canon and enforce anything upon anybody, but I'll, I'll, I'll go into that a bit more. So he picked up the tab, basically. Now, I'm going to talk about the invention of the Trinity because this is one of the strange misconceptions. And I've got some pictures if you can such put something this weird into a photo, <laughs> into a picture form. So I've got, uh, I've got a nice little Celtic uh, interlocking um, picture there and then a really old um, uh, model of the sort of three persons of the Christ. So when we say the Trinity, what we're talking about is that God is one, but God is made up of three divine persons, being the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this idea was not codified at Nicaea. What Nicaea was more concerned with was um, Christ, so the deity of Christ himself. Um, and the term Trinity we find uh, in earlier dates from Oregon to Tillian, and the general notion of a divine three in one sense or another um, goes back a, a full century or half a century to people like Polycarp, Ignatius, and Justin Martyr. And I've just got some Bible verses to show that, um, you know, it wasn't something just invented by the church because they felt like it and it had absolutely no basis. So I've got some biblical verses in there that sort of go to the Trinity. There are more. Um, uh, I think we've got a little bit of time, so I could maybe go through them. But um, I've got another image here on the right, which is really good. So it sort of talks about the three different persons there. You've got the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. So they're not each other, but they're all God. And I would say that there's the mystery and the majesty and the Trinity, and we can't just put it together in a, in a picture or, or into words, human words. But hopefully this is a little bit helpful to you. So, um, you know, the church looked at passages like Matthew 28 where Jesus is saying, go and make disciples and then you baptise them in the name of the Father, the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. So you've kind of got three named entities there. Um, you know, uh, you've got a lot of um, letters have been signed off saying, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, John 14 is another good example of where Jesus is talking about um, the Father and the Spirit in the same, um, the same verse. So he says there that he will ask the Father and he will give you an advocate to help you and he will be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. So um, Jesus is sort of ascribing personhood to the Spirit there as distinct from the Father. Does that make sense, guys? I'm just there to show you that um, a lot of these ideas existed well before the Council of Nicaea. Okay, that's, that's my point I'm trying to make. Uh, you know, whether I'm an atheist or a Christian or not, 
hopefully that comes across as just being some facts being presented to you guys so that you know Constantine didn't come up with it. He didn't force the bishops to come up with it. They didn't come up with it. Um, it it's actually sort of pre-existed. Um, the biblical canon is another strange misconception about the idea that somehow at the Council of Nicaea, the 27 books of the New Testament were created. Um, I did a little bit of research into where this bizarre misconception came from, and it seems like um, Voltaire actually popularised a story where um, they were sort of putting all the books of the Bible on, a, on an altar, and the ones that fell off were the ones that weren't included. Um, <laughs> Uh, it sounds a little bit crazy to us now, um, but in, you know, uh, in 887, who knows what you know, people would have believed. So uh, in the sense that if they get this piece of information out there, they might, they might adopt it. Um, so there's a document that he kind of pulled this from called uh, Synodicon Vet Vetus. My Greek's much better than my Latin. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was the one that was picked up. But if you look into it, and I hate saying modern scholars or experts believe. I hate putting these blanket kind of terms on things. Um, being a, you know, a lawyer, that's, like, that's anathema to me. But in actual fact, it's pretty unanimous that, that this sort of work has been uh, said to be inaccurate, unreliable, untrustworthy, and uh, not to mention 500 years late. So just to give you a bit of an idea, a bit like the, the Trinity thing, um, even by the third century, we had people like Oregon of Alexandria, who, who we think might have been using the same 27 books we've got in our New Testament now. Um, so in 1331, Constantine did commission some Bibles for the church in Constantinople, but that's sort of a little bit in line with him providing them funds. So they've gone from being completely persecuted to all of a sudden being flushed with state funds. So he could, uh, he could commission people to sit there and copy out Bibles for the church to use. Um, and really interestingly, in the Eastern, uh, Easter letter of Athanasius, who was a, a bishop in Alexandria, he actually gave the exact same 27 books of the Bible that we use today. That's pretty cool, I think. Which of those? Do I get points for closing my eyes and reciting them all? Yeah. <laughs> or does that make me a Pharisee? <laughs> of... Uh, my, I've been uh, taking to try and name all 50 US states, and my wife says, you should be learning this. This is more important. <laughs> all right. We're going to talk about the, uh, the divine nature of Christ, and I'm kind of, kind of going to merge two things in here. So one being that misconception that uh, Christ being uh, divine uh, as being invented somehow at Nicaea or something like that. Um, uh, so there's that controversy or that misconception that I want to uh, dispel here. And also I'm going to deal with um, uh, the Arian controversy, which is essentially the, the priest who was saying that Jesus is not divine. And that was part of the reason why the council got called in the first place. So hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to try and cover the two together. So he was a priest from uh, Alexandria in modern day Egypt. And it was actually Egypt back then too. Um, this is the only picture I could get of poor Arius. Um, but his concept was that, um, that Jesus was begotten from God at a point in time and therefore, uh, and therefore distinct from the Father, if that makes sense. He was sort of subordinate to the Father. He's not kind of co-eternal. Does that, does that make sense? Um, so today, from my understanding, there's some um, religious beliefs such as the Jehovah's Witnesses or the um, Ecclesia in Christo that have a similar Christological view. And um, I, what sort of call themselves mainstream Christian denominations would say that they, they don't believe the same things as these groups. Does that make sense? This is a massive minefield, and I don't really want to delve into it too much. And there are other groups that have differing views as well. Um, was there a question? No? Okay. Shoot. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so um, you'll see that uh, the Creed even talks about them being begotten, Jesus being begotten. I think the difference here is that um, um, this is what Arius is talking about is that this is happening in a point in time. 
right? And so what Christians believe is that God is outside of time and space. And so, um, therefore, the word of God, being Christ, existed before there was time. Does that, does that make sense? The three persons of the Trinity have always existed. There's always been an IU relationship for all before time even existed. Then you've got time, and all of a sudden you've got Arius saying Christ is being begotten at this point. Yeah, sorry, no, no, that's... Yeah, and you can imagine this being in Greek and the nuance is very small, um, you know, and you might get a Jehovah's Witness knocking on your door saying, you know, Jesus is Lord and, um, you know, he's begotten of the Father and all these sorts of things, but they don't actually mean it in the same way. So this is a thing where two words can kind of mean two drastically different things for two different groups of people. Does that, does that make sense? It's all about time. So either the word of God is eternal or it's, it's not. And, what the, and, and that was the fight. We're going to get to that. <laughs> oh, good. This is good stuff. This is good stuff. All right. I think we're at the half an hour mark, so I might uh, keep on powering through a bit. Um, so, again, I'm going to give you a little bit to dispel this misconception um, and to also give you what the council members, other than Arius, would have argued, I guess, if that makes sense. Um, so it might seem a little bit one-sided, but it's also there to dispel the idea that it was, that the idea that Christ was divine was invented then. So what Christians will actually say is that they will argue that Jesus himself has equated himself with God in, the, in his words in the Bible. Um, so I've just got a couple of verses there from the Bible that uh, have Jesus speaking. Um, he's talking to Philip here who had just said to him, show us the Father. And Jesus says, um, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Um, in Revelation, you know, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, um, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. And um, some of these words like Almighty or God or things like that, um, would, have, would have had tied backs to the Old Testament. And a perfect example of that is John 8. So Jesus is talking to some um, Pharisees here, I think, and he says, Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. How can you have seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So he's saying, Ihuah imeh. So if I say you're walking me hungry, my mum knows I'm saying I'm hungry, <laughs> right? And so they picked up stones to throw at him and Jesus went out of the temple. So this is an important point. What Jesus is doing here is he's equating himself with Yahweh because that's what Yahweh said to, you know, in the burning bush to Moses about saying, I am, I'm, that's my name, I am, in the Greek, you're me. And so Jesus is saying, before Abraham was, I am. That's where we're tying into a bit of this sort of timelessness. We cool? All right. <laughs> and then, of course, in John 10, Jesus says, you know, I and the Father are one. And then again, the opponents pick up the stones to, to stone him. Because, so some argue that part of the reason why Jesus was, was crucified was because of his claims, that he is equal with, with God. And, and saying that someone's your father sort of makes you equal with them. In, in that Jewish culture, so that's what they would have understood him to mean. Again, I'm just putting out their Christ, uh, Bible verses that shows why the Christian bishops there would have, would have known going into Nicaea that they had this idea that Jesus was divine. It wasn't something that they kind of concocted at the time. That's the takeaway here. I'm not here trying to argue one way or another. I'm just trying to get that point across, hopefully objectively, but probably not. <laughs> Can I have some thumbs up? All right. <laughs> Makes me feel better even if you don't believe it. <laughs> and then, you know, I've got, I've got more passages, um, you know, from the Bible, and these are about Jesus, not Jesus saying it. So John 20 is a good one when Thomas says, um, uh, He's saying, you know, oh, my Lord and my God. And this is after Christ is said to have reappeared to them and he had the wounds. And Thomas is like, I'm not going to believe that you're who you say you are unless I can touch the wounds. And he, he touches the wounds of Jesus' side. And Thomas says, um, well, my, uh, my Lord and my God. 
And Jesus doesn't go on to rebuke him and say something like, no, I'm not God, don't give me that honour. He just he accepts that. Does that make sense? And, then, you know, all through sort of Paul's and Peter's letters, we've got things about how, um, you know, in Romans 5, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're in Titus, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And then a lot of things, a lot of letters end, you know, um, with that sort of doxology. Um, Peter's another one, 2 Peter 1.1. 1, 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant of our, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind of ours by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. And there's heaps of others. See, I'm, I've gone to town the divinity of Christ. They've even got early church now. So I've got... Uh, uh, because of time, I won't go on it too much, but we've got some early Christian sort of um, theologians like Polycarp and Ignatius who, who talk about the Lord Jesus Christ as being, you know, God. Um, uh, so there's a couple of quotes there from, from pre-Nicaea. Is that, are we good with that, guys? All right. I've hammered into you this idea that <laughs> the, the Nicene bishops didn't make this up. And, and, you know, Arius would have used other types of arguments about how, you know, Jesus talks about being, um, you know, only the Father knows when, when I'll return and things like that. So um, there would have been some Bible verses that Arius had used um, to sort of uh, push his, his side of the argument. Um, and, and so this is what they would have been debating in the church, uh, in, the, in the council, even got even more for you. I've got Justin Martin, I've got Iranius, I've got them all. Anyway. Tried to highlight where they've called Jesus God, essentially. We good with that, guys? All right. I have to get this in because of my orthodoxy. This image here is actually one of the oldest depictions of Christ you'll ever find anywhere in the world. It's in a tiny monastery in Egypt called St. Catherine's. If you ever get a chance to go there, I highly recommend you go. Um, make sure it's safe, obviously. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Obviously, you know, if the Australian government's saying don't go there, don't go there. Um, but yeah, it's in Egypt, so in the Sinai Peninsula there, so on the, close, to, close to Israel, actually. So um, there's a little cute monastery there that has a picture of Christ. And um, can, this is going to be one of those point, times when you can get some points, guys. Can anyone see something weird about this image? What's weird about it? Uh, I'm sorry? Yes, okay. Five points, sir. What's your name? It's all good. So here, this is the bizarre thing about this icon, this, this image of Christ in St. Catherine's. Do you see his two eyes are different? This, I, I long to see this in real life. It's a, it's, a, it's a working Orthodox monastery, and this image is up on the wall there. So what, what it's showing is Christ's two natures, his humanity and his divinity. That's why the two sides of the faces are different. One of them is as the Pantocrator, the kind of almighty, the, uh, the one that uh, encompasses all of the universe, and the other is humanity. So with the marvels of modern technology, you can take the two halves and splice them together, and you can see what each half would look like if it was completed. Does that... That's cool, yeah? Come on. Thanks, guys. <laughs> So what I'm just trying to say is that, uh, you know, the idea of Christ being divine is, is, you know, was, was all over the place within the Roman Empire. Um, it was depicted in, in writings, in imagery, in all sorts of things. Um, and if you ever get a chance to go there, I will be very envious. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, it's actually what the church has always understood. Yeah, from <sighs> Who knows? It's, 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 this is, this is Pantocrator. The thing is that um, it's actually got the title, which is why I kind of wrote it in there. So um, 
This is him being depicted as the Almighty. It's different than, say, an, uh, an icon of Mary holding Jesus. He's not depicted as the Almighty in that. But is this, this is actually has a title of, uh, subscribed to it. And that's why we, we can see that divine nature and, uh, and human nature. I mean, uh, you know, orthodoxy, we're all about this. We're, we're all about, you know, union with God, you know, the sort of joining of the divine to human, humanity, you know. This is, this is, our, this is our jam, <laughs> you know. Um, for us, the, uh, the incarnation of Christ into, into Mary is like blows us away, you know. I mean, obviously the, cri- the cross is, is in a very important event um, to all Christians, um, but for, for the Orthodox Church, um, you know, Easter and the, and the cross is, is pinnacle, but we also sort of think about the incarnation and, and when, when the divine and humanity met in this, in this virgin's womb, it's kind of like, you know, that's what we're all trying to get to. We're all trying to become the bride of Christ, you know, and to have union with Christ. Um, so this stuff is not new at all. That's 1,600 years old. Come on, Protestants, and, and get excited. You're not all Protestants, I know. And unbelievers. This is, just, this, is on the, this is on a wall in a place you can go to now. So it doesn't matter whether you believe or not. The artwork's there. And apparently now that you've got a little town nearby and it's got like accommodation and you can get room service and then go to the, <laughs> go to the oldest working monastery um, in, in Eastern Christianity. You cool? All right, I'm at 41 minutes, so I'm going to have to power through a little bit. Um, one of the things that the Council of Nicaea wanted to sort out was the date of Easter. And guess what? They have failed. <laughs> who, knows, who knows why I said that? That's right. <laughs> so it's still different. So, you know, the Council of Nicaea achieved some things, and they blew some other things. And this was one of the ones they didn't quite get there on. Um, it's a little bit complicated. Um, the reason why we're out now is because the Eastern Church and the Western Church use different calendars. So um, the Eastern Church actually uses the Julian calendar for calculating dates of Easter, and the Western Church uses the Gregorian. Um, but the reason why there was a bit of a mix-up in the early church is because um, uh, Easter is, is uh, inextricably... That's not the word cannot be <laughs> separated from Passover. Okay, so what Christians believe is that Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb for them. So that idea of this sort of Jewish festival of um, celebrating when the innocent lamb's blood is spread over the doorposts and uh, the angel of death passes over and um, passes them from death to life. So Christians see Jesus as the perfect Passover lamb who was crucified at Passover, and therefore Christians can pass from death to life because of Christ being the Passover lamb. And so what was happening was some Christians were kind of tying their Easter celebrations to um, when the Jews did their Passover, which was linked to lunar cycles. Some of them weren't happy with the Jews, and there was, you know, there was some, there was a lot of tension between Christians and Judaism back then, and so some of them just kind of calculated it themselves. Um, unfortunately, the council kind of declared that Easter needed to be on a Sunday, um, but they didn't link it to the moon, and so somehow there was some weird dispute about which Sunday it would be, and we're still dealing with it. And sometimes the Eastern Church gets cheap chocolate eggs because. They're all on sale because it happens a week later. <laughs> so I heard a joke once that that was the reason why they did it. <laughs> all right. We can laugh at ourselves. All right. The other thing that was done at the, church, at the Council of Nicaea was there's some, there's some just church laws were decided. And, and when I was looking into this, I was actually quite impressed because um, some of them were against some really bad things. So they, they installed a prohibition against uh, usury. I'm not quite sure how it's pronounced, but it's essentially high-interest loans. So they didn't want the clergy doing, getting involved in high-interest loans with poor people. Um, they also prohibited self-castration because I think there was this idea of being pure if you had been castrated and, and you know, celibacy and all this sort of stuff. So they outlawed that. 
they also put in the idea that you need to have three bishops present when you confirm another bishop. Um, so, look, some good stuff. Um, apparently there's 20 different ones there. Um, but we're running out of time, so I'm not going to go into all of them. But, of course, the most enduring sort of thing that came out of the council is what we call the Nicene Creed. So, there's some nice pictures to keep Kevin happy. We've got, uh, got uh, I think it's Constantine there and all, all the bishops with the, with the Nicene Creed in, in ancient Greek, and then we've got some old papyri. Um, Like I said before, everyone, um, there was one formulated in 325 when the council actually happened. And this isn't the one you generally hear today because they actually kind of tweaked it in Constantinople about 55 years later or something like that. But this is how the creed goes. And it goes, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, the only begotten, that is, of the essence of the Father, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being one substance with the Father, and there's a really fancy Greek word for that, um, by whom all things were made in heaven and on earth, who for us men, for our salvation, came down and was incarnate and was made man. He suffered, and on the third day he rose again, ascended into heaven, from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead and in the Holy Ghost. So this is an English translation of a Greek creed. Um, uh, that's the sort of original version in Nicaea. And then we've got a little bit of a, a fleshing out at Constantinople in 381. Um, because I'm running short on time, I won't go through all of it. But the thing is that can you see how they're talking about very God of very God, one substance with the Father, light of light. They're kind of <laughs> they're pushing the idea that, that Jesus is, is one with the Father. Do you, do you see they, they, they have to be so strong with their language so that um, no one can confuse it with the Aryan idea that uh, he was begotten later. Does this kind of make sense, guys? Can you see where they're coming from? They, they, they're not very subtle about it. <laughs> Um, but they felt that it was a, you know, it was a dangerous situation, and and, and that, um, you know, theologically and philosophically, if if it's not God up on the cross, then it's just a man up on the cross, and no man's going to atone for anyone else's sins. So this is why it's central to Christianity, and I would say it's central to Eastern and Western Christianity that you've got God up on that cross, because only God can take away the punishment. That's why they were so kind of hardcore about it. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. So what's this Greek word? Oh, who, who knows? Sorry, mate. Hi, Hesusis is the one substance that, that's the co-substantiential. Well, there's also a different, yeah, okay, so you've kind of got the Father as being the sort of monarch within the Trinity, but they're still co-equal. This, the, this is the mystery and the majesty in there, but, yeah. Begotten, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yep, yeah, okay, yeah, so I don't actually, I don't know, unfortunately. say it right, it's monogenous. Monogenous. Only begotten. Yeah, so, yeah, but I don't know. Yep, that's the same substance. Yep, that's right. Because with Greek, it's kind of like different letters denote different kind of time periods or different emphasis. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, I am enrolled in a graduate diploma of theology, but I've done no subjects. <laughs> so, unfortunately, I haven't done uh, 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 the old Greek, I guess. I've just done... Um, uh, getting pitta from grandma, Greek, um, which is not totally dissimilar, but uh, I couldn't, that's probably a, a chat for another time perhaps. Yeah, the idea is though that, you know, they're talking about Christ being God of God and light of light and being co-equal. Now, one important thing I will say is I've underlined uh, a line down there, down the bottom saying that, that, um, that they believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and the giver of life 
life who proceedeth from the Father and who with the Father and the Son together are worshipped and glorified and spoke by the prophets. Why do you think I underline that section, guys? Yes, very good. Full points. Because we've got an addition later on by our Roman Catholic, I'll use the word brothers. Um, I'm not going to go into this. All I'm going to do is just, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because if you walk into a church today, a Protestant church today, or a Catholic church today, you are going to sometimes see the creed read out, and you are going to see this addition in here that is saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So for the Eastern Church, this is a really upsetting thing because what happened was that the Roman Catholic Church, the Bishop of Rome, unilaterally changed this section of the creed. Okay? So they didn't do it in an ecumenical council. That's where all my striving comes together, hopefully. Does that make sense? They did this not in an ecumenical council. They did this on their own without the Eastern Churches present. Okay, and obviously you've got the Protestant churches coming out of the Rome, out of Rome, and so they've kind of always said the creed this way, and and they've adopted it. Now the East has some troubles with this because um, you know they feel like it relegates the Holy Spirit to a sort of third place. But I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to get into the theology of it. I just want to make you aware that the sort of legacy of the Nicene Council is the creed. And it's actually today one of the greatest sources of controversy within Christianity. So a little bit after this change, there was you know, the Fourth and the Fifth Crusade. There was the Bishop of Rome saying things about them being kind of um, taking precedence over the other patriarchs. And then you have the split between the East and the West that has not been healed to this day. Okay, so this, this change was actually part of the reason why the, why the split occurred in church history. And this is the first major one, which is why they call it the Great Schism. And I would say that there's probably a, an opportunity for another talk just on that. Just telling the facts, guys. <laughs> right, so the council today. What does it mean for us? You know, it's not quite as Sexy as say Dan Brown will make it out to believe, not as much happened as you think. <laughs> Does that make sense? Um, you know, Constantine didn't control the council by force. The New Testament canon was not decided. The doctrine of the Trinity was not first thought up or discussed. Um, the idea that Jesus was divine did not get invented. Uh, none of those things happened. Um, I would say that what's most important about it is that it was a really important marker along the road of history because you've got kind of a pagan Roman empire for the first time. This is the first council where kind of Christians from all over the known world have met. So in that sense, it's important to all of us as part of Western and even Eastern uh, history. Does that, does that make sense? That's why it's sort of enduring. It's the first of the seven ecumenical councils. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that they sort of failed in Easter <laughs> and, uh, and that the, we've got the creed today is some of the sort of most important things that have come out of the council at Nicaea. Um, and I've got there some points about you know, it being recognised and all the rest of it. I would, if you're interested in what denominations sort of recognise the councils, it's often good to look at their statements of faith, have a look at their doctrines and these sorts of things of which, which uh, denominations have sort of accepted it and to what degree. And uh, I reckon I'm going to leave it there because I'm on about 55 minutes. So um, thank you all very much. You're a great, great uh, group. Thank you. idea of the church, uh, the council of Nicaea. No, before, before Nicaea, there would have been no centralised control. That's right. That's and there right. wasn't really afterwards, neither. No, that's true too. Yeah. But the reason they included that provision about circumcision was because there was a very powerful uh, religious movement, the followers of ISIS, um, which they've been around for thousands of years. 
Um, and one of the, the common practices was the, the male followers of Isis would castrate themselves yep. as a sacrificial yep. uh, to, the, to the goddess Isis. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, very good. Yeah. So that, that was the reason. Yeah, for that's, that a good, that's a good addition. You might have to chuck an extra slide yeah, in, but yeah. they, uh, that was one of the 20 rules. Yeah. That they wrote in yeah. The other thing was the the Trinity wasn't hundreds of years old; it's actually thousands of years old <laughs> because the Egyptians had it, and the Babylonians had it, and the Indians had it thousands of years before. Sorry, what the did they Jew, have before Trinity. Christianity? Trinity. The Trinity. Yeah. yeah well, that, that's I, I can't that. remember who, what the Egyptian uh, Trinity was. It was uh, Is Isis. Um, Sorry. Oh, anyway, um, Horus, Isis, and uh, oh, one of the others. Yes, that, anyway, that's probably so a whole other topic, yeah, actually, yeah. because they're not—they're so, not the same, and they're not exactly the same. Yeah. And Christians would say that we, you know, that they see the Trinity all the way back to, you know, Genesis one one, like sure. let us make man or whatever, you know. Um, uh, they would say that there's Trinity and Theophanies uh, throughout the Old Testament as well. It didn't just kind of, uh, which I, I didn't uh, have any Old Testament scriptures in there. Um, but, you know, there's probably even more. The, the, yeah. the thing was that the Trinity concept was not, had no relationship whatsoever to Judaism, no relationship whatsoever to Jesus. Uh, and I've said this before that Christianity has no connection whatsoever to the original Jesus. Christianity was a, a deviant heathen sect that evolved from the teachings of Paul. Okay, so that, but uh, that that's, that's not something that I would agree with, <laughs> and that's, that's yeah. you might have to yeah. agree or disagree on that one. But you, you'd have, um, to, read, you like, have I... to understand the book of Galatians and the, uh, the Gnostic underpinnings of it. Yeah, no, but, but we won't go into that. No, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that would be no. quite. A bit. <laughs> Which is why understanding church history um, has allayed some of those sorts of you know fears for me, and um, why I recommend going to some of these places as well. When you, you know, when you go into an eighteen hundred year old monastery or something like that, and you're seeing you're seeing that the depictions of the Bible exactly as you see in an Orthodox church today. It actually gives you heart that there's continuity, and um, mm -hmm. you know if you take the current bishop of, of Alexandria or the current bishop of, of Constantinople, and you you can trace each one back all through the you know the original apostles. So um, you know I think there's a robustness there in the Eastern Church which can kind of dispel some of those things. But um, yeah, I'll just give someone one of that. one of the comments by a Sabinus who was bishop of Heraclea was that. Of the 300 bishops that attended, only um, Constantine and one other were literate. The rest couldn't read. But he was uh, very anti-Constantine and the, the, the early church, okay. so he could have been uh, fudging his yeah. comments a yeah. little bit. That's but the, the, the point is that it is a fact that the bishops and the, the lady of the church were basically ignorant, illiterate peasants. Um, very few of them could read. And in fact, the, the, the early church encouraged that. They didn't want people that could think because um, if they would ask questions. Well, you know, the, we've actually got... We do have piles and piles of letters from bishops all over uh, Christendom, which... Um, you know, certainly the everyday person would have been illiterate, which is why uh, the Eastern Church has, and, and Roman Church as well, has such a rich uh, history of iconography because you can kind of look at the resurrection icon or the transfiguration one and you can see what it is because you can't read. But certainly the bishop, we've got letters from all, all over the areas, uh, all sorts of bishops writing all sorts of things. I think the letters from Athanasius are one of the, one of the great ones to read, um, but I might... Yeah, like you yeah. see, a lot of the bishops, wrote the <laughs> lot of the bishops didn't write the letters, so they dictated them. Well, see, uh, what they had conditions scribes. they actually had to provide their own doctrine or, or understanding it before the, it all started. So they actually had to submit their doctrine of understanding. You know, and each different group had different understandings and different books. 
So that was one of the conditions, a bit like providing a book you can't read, it's a bit like. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, one yeah. of the things I, I'm interested in is how many languages did they speak and, and how many translators did they speak? Yeah, that would have been really so, no, interesting. I mean, um, we've got modern technology now. Yeah, so this is sort of post Alexander the Great, you know, sort so, of. So, was the language Latin or Greek that yeah. it was, it was? My understanding is that the everyday language would have been Greek. That's of, the, that's of the area, but what about all the people that you came see they're from, coming from Britain as far away? Yeah, so oh, there that, would have been would, some would, would Latin have speakers. Um, they would have been Latin speakers. Yeah, there would some Latin well. speakers for sure. There would have been some Greek speakers. A bit like, you and know... Constantine would have spoken Latin. Yeah, probably. And he yeah. would have spoken Greek, I would have thought, as well. Um, yeah. You know, like in Jesus, we've got... Jesus' time, we've got Aramaic, we've got um, <coughs> Greek, we've got Latin. Um, but, you know... Alexander the Great did conquer a massive part of the sort of known world and spread that kind of Hellenism um, through all those areas in the East. And um, yeah, so I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I'm just interested yeah. to know what That's right, the, yeah. the language of was yeah. it. Really yeah. Latin or Aramaic Greek? was one of the common languages that, yeah. it, um, that if you couldn't speak Latin or Greek, uh, a lot of people could understand Aramaic. And that had been the stand, sort of the, so the basic language to communicate between the different groups for hundreds of years. So it was. So, sorry. Yeah. When I you... found it interesting that Athanasius actually went to the the council, but he went as a deacon because he wasn't a bishop. Yeah. He wasn't permitted to actually go into that whole big discussion. Council was. Yeah, I think that's but right. Yeah, he was there as support person, as were many other deacons and support people of the bishops at that time. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So who knows how many people were actually there? But he was a, from what I understand, and I might be getting them confused, but he was a great opponent of Arius, sort of all throughout and after, before, <laughs> after. <laughs> And Afterwards, he really supported and promoted the Nicene Creed. He did. He was, he was the, I think, I think the Orthodox have got a title for him. It's like the father of Orthodoxy or something mm, like that. Yeah. Like he's the kind of, he's the guy. Mm -hmm. So there was a question around here somewhere? Was it? Yeah. Well, um, just getting back to the question of the language, my understanding is that because the Greek empires or the four of more the Greek was so dominant for so long, Greek language was the sort of international language after yeah. the Romans took over, and so they, yes. that was still the international language, a bit like French was until the 1920s or yeah. English is today. But um, you did make the point that in the early, early invitations were sent out to a lot more Eastern bishops than Western church yeah. bishops. And um, in the very early church, there were something like several, four or five times more Eastern believers, yes. and they were mostly Aramaic speakers, than there were um, Western believers, mainly because of Paul, of course, that we focused on yeah, his yeah. letters, but, but Peter was uh, a long time in Babylon, apparently, and so on. Yeah, you got um, Thomas down in India, you've got yeah. all sorts of, you know, you've got very far east. Yeah. Um, so the, the big issue I've raised here once before is about how I believe, after looking into it, that the originals were written in Hebrew or Aramaic and then translated into Greek very early on, uh, but that there was so much anti-Semitism and so on that they got rid of all the Hebrew copies and, and there was such a divide, of course, when the Muslim power came in that, that the, the far eastern parts would still speak Aramaic today um, <coughs> were sort of separated from the Greek-speaking part and that, that there's um, you know, good reason to believe that the Aramaic copies would still exist, uh, some reliable copies um, are actually more accurate than the Greek copies. Okay, there's a couple of things to say about that. Um, my understanding is that the sort of biblical Aramaic is not spoken today anymore. Um, if you actually watch the, the Passion of the Christ is a really interesting movie. If you watch the sort of making of it, they actually had to develop an Aramaic language um, for the actors to say um, because they were saying that it was dead. Um, and you've got some authors of the New Testament like Luke, who my understanding is, you know, he was Greek and he probably would have, he would have written Luke and Acts in Greek. Um, I don't know, I imagine why he would have written it in anything else. Um, and I do imagine that the Roman soldiers in Jerusalem that crucified Christ would have spoken Greek. I don't see that why they would have spoken Latin. Um, that's yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to, happy to take that away. And, and look the, the Aramaic is still spoken. I don't know if they've killed them all yet, but there was a town in Syria called Ma'alula yeah. that was overrun by ISIL, ISIS okay. in the last couple of years. And it was often, when that town was being spoken of, they often said, a town that still speaks Aramaic, yeah, right. the language of Jesus. And yeah. that was their daily language. Now, whether or not they could discuss all the matters they would have wanted to have in the movie is another thing. Yeah. Because some languages are so strong. Yeah, 
that they, they can't discuss certain topics in them because there aren't words. You know? yeah. Yeah. language of Chaucer, don't we? Yeah. Well, it's like Greek and, and uh, Koine Greek. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Um, they're not the same thing, but every day. I think important things are the same, like cat and door and <laughs> you know, food. But, uh, you know, uh, there's definitely what was spoken then and what was spoken now, even with, with Latin and Greek, is different, yeah. a bit different. Yeah, I'm not sure. sure. I'd love to bring, you know, teleport one person in here and just get them to talk about a soccer match or something and see if, they can, see if they can talk to each other or not, or, you know, but, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Did anyone, is there anyone on this side? I thought I saw the odd hand somewhere, but... All right, well, oh, I don't have the peripheral to get to catch you away. Okay, okay, back to the cat. Oh, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. To find the trinity, get three of coffee. Yeah. There's all the baguettes in there. Yeah, yeah. Bar, right? And baguettes imply an order. So I'd never really thought about this, and you've made me, uh -uh. You've made me really um, think about it. So the, the, it, it, if the word begotten implies an order, then why are they using it, the word to, to dismiss the Aryan heresy? Can I, and they put it in the Greek. Can I comment on that one? Yeah. C.S. Yeah. Lewis addressed that particular issue in his book, Mere Christianity, and one of the analogies he used was of a table and a book. So, for example, I'll just use the chair and the phone. Um, this chair is here, I can therefore put my phone on it, and the chair is now supporting the phone. But I couldn't put the phone there until the chair was already there. If they'd already always been there like that, and there had never been a time when the phone was put on the chair was like that, then in that sense, the support is a state, not a becoming. And so in the same sense, a begotten and father is a state, a relationship, not an order in time. Brilliant, but proceeds from the father, and probably not from the evening and the son, um, but proceeds. Proceeds that's being also sent, that's being sent. Mm. Uh, okay. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Thanks. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's just it's so hard for us because we're very linear people, right? Mm. So when we need to, if, to have order, you must have time because you must have no, 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 no. That's actually no. You don't. Why not? Well, because <laughs> there could be a and I'm going to quote William Lane Craig here, <laughs> right? Um, before there was time, yeah. God could have been mentally counting down to creation. Three, two, one, <laughs> right? So yeah, but not the way order, we know it. But you have saying. order, but you don't have time. No, that's right. And but that's not the way that we know it. show where there can be order without yeah. time. Oh, yeah, so God can do anything. Like, we won't, you know, but um, <clears throat> it's just hard for us humans because we're trying to use language to describe something that's outside yes. of our universe. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. See, Hebrew can use about five or six words to describe one word which we just use for, you know, Chair, you know, they can call it. Yeah, that's right. A lots of different ways we can address it as it and just call day it is a good example of that. You know, yom, you have the day of the it's Lord, love, you know, day of rest, love, you've got twenty four hours, different degrees. Of <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Gee, this is uh, this is hard. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've had easier times in the yeah. Supreme Court actually. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 You, you, you Sorry, you're the next. You refer to the uh, Philippi. Ah, yes, Philippi. Philippi. My understanding of this is that the Orthodox Church um, object to that, not because they don't believe what it says, but purely because of process. That <laughs> <laughs> it didn't come out to make an ecumenical <laughs> council and right. yeah, shouldn't have to be done because. Uh, so oh. the big objection is about process and not about the, the content. The content. Okay, so that is a very good question, and I would say, knowing what us Easterners are like, we're holding a grudge, <laughs> right? So I reckon there's heaps of truth to what you just said, except there is theological issues with it uh, in the Eastern Church right, as well. Okay. There really are, there really is. So what, what I think might be okay is that the Holy Spirit um, uh, proceeds from the Father through the Son, Mm, okay. we, I'd say the Eastern Church might, might be okay with that. So what, what the Eastern Church is saying is that the Holy Spirit doesn't proceed through the Father in the same way as it does the Son. Oh, okay, right. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Now, um, there's even some Protestants who agree with that. Like if you ask a Lutheran, they would say, yeah, that's right. The Holy Spirit doesn't proceed from the Father and the Son in the same way. And so you think maybe there might be some, some way of bridging the gap. Mm -hmm.
But unfortunately, um, it's just on the sort of way it reads, it's really, it's really oh, killed yeah. it. And so um, they, they don't want to see the Holy Spirit relegated in that, in that situation. And, and, and yeah, it's a massive, massive topic, bigger than me, bigger than my knowledge. Um, I would say it's definitely a grudge, definitely an upset that, hey, you guys did this without us. Upset about the circumstances around it that happened in the same sort of couple of years with, with you know, crusades and you know some other bad stuff, and maybe it kind of got kept, like caught up in all of that too. Um, but there is theological issues with it. How um, long did the process really take? You know, we're talking about a council. Yeah. This wasn't a week. It wasn't a month. We're talking years. Mm. This is a three-year, four-year process. Mm. Or whatever it was. Well, how long did the, That's a good the question. council? How long did the council? My understanding it was it was only yeah, like months, months, yeah. like weeks and months, yeah. not like years. Yeah. yeah, but hang on, traveling from Britain yeah. to to uh, the, the logistics. That's probably three or four months <laughs> right there. The logistics were <laughs> <three laughs> yeah. yeah. You yeah. want to yeah. hold it a fair <laughs> bit, you know, down the track to the time yeah. everyone to get yeah, there right. for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. When we, when we formed yeah. Reasonable Faith, we um, had to come up with some positional statement, and so uh, we actually adopted the Nicene Creed as our positional statement. <laughs> Which one? So, uh, Please try. Good <laughs> point. Uh, because um, uh, we, um, yeah, so we, we chose the, the Nicene Creed, and Mark Worthing was on the committee at the time. Yeah. And um, I want to leave it open for both. Uh, East and West, so yeah. I suggested we drop the Philippe. Oh, really? Of course. Um, so that's my wider. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but Mark said, no. The reason why they got all um, shirky about it in the first place is because it was inserted without their permission. So if you just go and make a decision now and drop it, they'll still be. That's that's probably true. There is there's a really good um, book on the Trinity that I've got that a lot of. Um, curriculum use. It's got a fantastic chapter on it, very objective, just kind of just sets out why, like what the theological issue is. And, um, you know, I would say that if somebody does a talk on the Great Schism, then this would have to form part of that, that discussion. I, I vote for you, actually. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. All right, all right. I heard him. No, I need a second or a third. <laughs> I'm not yes, I'll second it. <laughs> um, um, yeah. What was I going to say? You were going to... Sorry? I'm not telling. No. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, what I was going to say was that uh, I think it's John, Pope John Paul. He actually um, did a liturgy with the uh, ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, who's um, sort of the. Be very careful with my language here. He's kind of like the most honoured person in the Orthodox Church, but he's not a pope in any way that, like, like the pope is. Anyway, my understanding is that they read the Nicene Creed together in Greek. And so he said it in Greek and he didn't add the filigree in it as a sort of sign of respect to the Eastern Church because he was they were together reading it together and they did it in Greek and they did it without it. So that was really interesting. So um, Pope John Paul and my understanding is the current Pope is interested in, in reconciliation in this way. And, and there was even talk of whenever the creed is read in Greek, we won't add it in. But if it's read in English or Latin or something else, we will. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's some interesting dialogue going on there or in that space. Mm -hmm. Even though there's other issues. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, Julie. Yeah, you've been patiently waiting. Oh, well, just a couple of things, but I've mounted up well, of the way. Yeah, sure. Uh, on the filioque, um, yeah. adding that in uh, unilaterally like that was a. a a tacit claim for supremacy of the whole over the whole church, and I think that's pretty cheeky. <laughs> and I can, it's not just having a grudge about that, that's a big issue. Like, yeah. you know, who are you to be, you know, claiming that? So, there's that. I'm not orthodox, but I, I try to see it from everyone's point of view, yeah, yeah. And that's um, the agree, yeah, um, definitely, because <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, that's, I'm just trying to be objective. If I, yeah. you know, I'd like to think that, you know, if I was an atheist, I would present this in as much a similar way as I could because I'm just trying to. Put it out there. I don't speak for any particular group. I don't think atheists get Christianity. No, but say say I was just someone that knew my history back to front, which I don't. But mm. say I did. I'd like to think I would have presented it in a fairly similar way because I don't I don't know. Um, I, I've done a lot of growing up in Protestant churches uh, myself, so I don't know the Eastern Church 
that well. Um, but there just seems to be such a vacuum of knowledge about it that even having a little bit of knowledge makes you, <laughs> it makes you a bit of an expert, which is, uh, you know, a bit of a... Now, if I could get yeah. back to the point about the gap, yeah, yeah. Um, I've only read the thing in, 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 in text, right? Yeah. And to me, I think it looks like monogenes, which is yeah. monos only, one, 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 and genes is like generated. Yeah. So the, the, the whole thing is, this person is the one and only begotten, the supremely different to all our... We're all adopted sons of God. Yeah. He's son of God in a completely different sense. Yeah. And supreme yeah. over us and worthy, worthy of worship. Um, so I get that out of it. And the other thing about begat is I don't so much focus, even in human terms, on um, who's older than who. Mm. Once, I was, once I was 50, my 80-year-old parents were absolutely treating me like an equal. Right? Yeah, once you're right. a certain age, you're both in the mature years. You've got through being a teenager, a 20-something, a 30-something. You really are mentally pretty much equal. And then they start going down a little bit. Um, so there's that too. And for me, the begat is like, oh, you, again, you're the same nature as the person that, as the one that begat you. If you have a cat that has kittens, uh, they, a woman doesn't have kittens. So to be begat, begotten by God is, again, that same nature of God being passed on. Not so much that the father was older than the son, but he was the same nature. That's yeah. So that's all the stuff I take out of that word. It's not the who's older than who, because, it, again, in eternity, there's no such thing as... Who's older than who? Because they're co the co-eternal. Yeah. So right. that's just my tuppence on the, the yeah. gap. <laughs> and, and it no. might help you to think of Jesus as the um, the Word of God. Yeah. As well, because um, when when an Orthodox person holds a Bible, they say this is this is God's Word, but it's not the Word of God because that's a title that's only for Christ. You know. Yeah. And so the Father, so, the Father's words are the Father, are the Father. Yeah. Second so call. Yeah, sorry yeah. to butt in, but some people yeah. call the Bible the word about the word of God. Yeah, 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 yeah. So. yeah but you never, you never hear an Eastern priest really, mm -hmm. well, you know, if they're thinking about it, they would say this is God's word, but the word of God is Christ, yes. and that is a title for Christ, and that is it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just on the subject of begotten, my understanding is that that means conceived. That's what the word really means. And that in First Peter it talks about how chapter one I think it is talks about how we are begotten of God, and then later on in the same chapter it talks about how we are born again of the Spirit of God or something. Well, apparently it's the same word, and the word means begotten. And so, uh, although we're all familiar with John chapter three where it says you must be born again of water and of the Spirit, uh, the implication is that we don't actually get born again of the Spirit until we have a new body by the Spirit, which is after. Messiah returns and, oh. and uh, you know, we, we give a new body which is imperishable and so on. So the implication is that until then we are in the sort of gestation period, like a <laughs> nine month gestation period, and we all can be sort of miscarried or aborted or whatever you might, and, you know, we might lose our way if we're not careful during that period. Um, but, uh, you know, when they're born again of water, it may mean when the mother's water, you know, water breaks. Yeah. And uh, born again of the spirit is when we get our new That's body. That's interesting. Well, one thing that I've found about Christianity that I find intriguing is that things tend to be true on multiple levels, mm. which I've been quite impressed with, actually. Um, so, 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 you know, that, that could be true and we get a rebirth now as well, and it can be true on multiple levels. Does that, does that make sense? There's other examples yeah. of it where something's true then, it's true now, and it's going to be true in the future, yeah. you know. Um, again, that's, that's actually how... Um, you should come and join the Orthodox Church because you sort of, they sort of see salvation as um, I was saved, yeah, right. I'm being saved, and I will be saved. Mm -hmm. well, that's it's not that um, I did the sinner's prayer on November 17, 1983, and that's, that's when I was saved. Uh, an Orthodox person would sort of look at it like it's a process. And then, then there's that whole sort of Christianity mirroring a, um, a Jewish wedding, you know, where the... Um, where the bridegroom goes to the parents' house and, um, you know, they decide that they're going to become married, but then they actually don't, they don't get married then. The, the bridegroom goes away for, you know, a year and prepares a place and then comes back and takes the bride. And so we're in that kind of space as well, and it's really, really intriguing. So, yeah, it's an interesting thought, but it's all about me. <laughs> you know, so like, let me add to that really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, 
what you've just said is basically the the context of Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. Yeah, okay. And when I last checked, he's not orthodox. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so that's... That, oh, that, look, it's not... There's no monopoly on it. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. no monopoly on it. Uh, don't get me wrong. But, but you said you claimed that that was a bit of really orthodox thinking, and it was, well, it's really interesting if you think about how much work N.T. Wright's done in ecumenical... Yeah, uh, yeah. ...and to actually yeah, yeah. further ecumenical causes. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's it's right. No, I was just sort of contrasting yeah. it with the sinner's prayer idea, yeah, you know, yeah. um, where people kind of have the exact date. And that's, that's cool. Um, you know, I'm just... Uh, I know that I've had conversations with people, with Protestants, um, and I kind of consider myself a Protestant, right, <laughs> in a lot of ways. Um, and I'm just like, well, that's exactly what the Eastern Church thinks of that. You know, it happens all the time. And this is the problem is there's just a lack of understanding between the groups and there's a lot more common ground than you than you than you possibly imagine. And, and I would add to that, yeah. When I've got a deeper understanding of Pentecostalism, yeah. I find the same uh, the same ethic and the same narrative in 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 a large part of Pentecostal uh, tradition. Yeah, as well. like the idea certainly of, earlier rather than later, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Like the idea of a baptism of uh, in the Holy uh, of the Holy Spirit, um, you know. Orthodox talk about that, and they sort of at your baptism, you kind of they have two sort of parts to it. They talk about baptism of the Holy Spirit as well as the baptism in water. And I was thinking, wow, the, the last time I kind of heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit was back in my AOG days, you know. Um, so I didn't mean that specifically. Yeah. I was talking about like the whole, new, you know, in Anglican we call it new creation yeah. ministries. What you're talking about here is rebirth and, and recreation. You just mentioned, you know, we're born. Uh, again, you're, um, uh, we go through a gestation, or perhaps it was yourself. I'm just saying that same metaphor carries across a lot more widely than I had previously understood. Yeah, it's interesting. Anyway, sorry, I mean, buddy. I would like to see more dialogue between the different groups. Yeah, so Yeah, mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, maybe today more than ever, it's, it's probably important. Um, it saddens me that there might be two churches on the same street that don't, don't talk to each other. Um, and we had to, I had to work through these things, you know, because uh, uh, my, my wife's not Greek, and so, and even just personally, because I've grown up in both, both traditions, and, uh, you know, my knowledge of Roman Catholicism is quite limited as well, and I need to have a better understanding of that too. Yeah. Um, going to the Nicene Creed, sure. and this might be displaying some of my ignorance, but yep. um, I doubt it. <laughs> there was a phrase that said, judge the quick and the dead, and I'm just wondering what's the derivation of the word quick? Yeah, Where I, does that come from, and I what does it actually mean? Yeah, it sometimes gets rendered as the living and the dead. Yeah. I suspect that's what it was, yeah. but I'm wondering why quick in particular. Yeah, yeah. I hope so, that's King James, James in English. King James in yeah, English. that's right. Yeah. So I think quick as in quickening. As in, as in, as in, yeah, yeah, us and those who are kind of alive. I always got told it was the quick as in the bit that hurts and is alive under your finger versus the dead <laughs> that's actually not alive. That's called the quick. Alive. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. That's that's, there you go. Sure. Yeah. yeah, I just think of the movie The Quick and the Dead. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's what I thought. The Western, the Western, yeah. There you go. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. I just, yeah, because sometimes it gets rendered... Uh, and I, I had the source of who translated mm. it into English. Unfortunately, yeah, it's like Robert Phillips and one. Yeah, it's yeah. 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 just King James English. All right. That's right. Mm. Greg. Sorry, Greg. Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, sort of drop it down the street level here because okay. there's so much knowledge in this room that's blowing my mind. Yeah. Um, for a friend who has heard this sort of stuff through the Vichy Code and yep. conspiracy theories or whatever, um, yeah. where do you take them as far as you know getting to? place where they can see this as unbiased and it's Christians telling about Christian history and so yeah, it's all tainted yeah. Yeah, in a yeah. way so you can have a conversation just about the historical facts. Yeah, wow. The... Very important question, obviously. Oh, I, 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 very good, educa very, educating myself. Very good and very important question. Um, yeah, it's really hard because the stuff around the sources for this was actually quite difficult to nail down and it was the hardest part of putting the pack together. Um, uh, Could tell them to watch this YouTube. But... Yeah, that might be a start. <laughs> um, yeah, Perry's, Perry's talk, which you've referenced. Sorry, Perry's, Perry's talk, talk is a good one. 
Yeah, it was, it was almost in the Yeah, it was uh, maybe two months ago, was it? Um, it was on Constantine, you'll see it on the... On the I'd say the last YouTube. three or four videos have been relevant to this relevant topic. Because there was one about the very ancient, uh, like the um, Dead Sea Scrolls and that sort of stuff, yeah, which yeah. confused a lot of people. But it, And then the one on the authorship of Paul's letters. Yeah. And the same sort of thing. What rights... See, see, if you do find a document, so what? What relevance does it have to us, and how should you believe it? Just because we read a book by Dan Brown, mm. what, who's he? And actually, the, um, the, there, were, there must have been a talk I know about the biblical canon and how that kind of came to wiggle yeah. the ringer out. Yeah. That's another good one. It's really just history, you know. Um, you just got to know your history, and, and a lot of these misconceptions just get um, uh, dispelled very quickly. Mm. Um, I mean, you have to look at people's motivation. You have to ask these people, what do you think this Dan Brown's motivation was? You know, mm. Mm. Um, where is he getting his sources from? Um, this is a relatively new invention. You know, um, it's a good question. I don't know. I mean, short of giving him a textbook. Yeah, I mean, you he's, know, he's it's definitely a, thinking. Like, it's a personal friend of mine. So, yeah, you know, yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of damage done. There's a lot of damage done. Well, it's a quick and easy answer to. Yeah, you know, I don't have to worry about. That's it. right. I can dismiss it. Yeah, yeah. So how to. Yeah, well, running. Yeah, ah, that's a good question. Well, that's it. I can make a film, so everyone starts to believe the film, not the facts. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. we can get our, we can get our yeah. philosophy yeah. mixed up with half truths. Yeah. And it's happening more with a lot of these films, a lot of these, you know, a bit like Noah film. You know, there's some truth. But yeah. I'll tell you what, there's a lot of lot untruth going on here. Mm -hmm. And we can do you know, it on. Yeah. Do you know what I would do? I would direct that question to the staff here at table. And I would say, because they might be able to put someone, <laughs> with a friend of yours, in touch with uh, maybe like a secular historian that's not a Christian, mm. that can, because even a secular historian can dispel this happily for you. Do you know what I mean? And then they might be more willing to listen to someone like that who doesn't have an agenda or isn't tainted or yeah, something yeah. like that. I would get in touch with the with the uh, staff here and say, look, had this really, you know, hopefully really interesting, um, you know, talk I went to, and it's raised a question about a mate of mine. Um, you know, uh, what are the sources I can use? Do you have someone who is not perhaps a Christian that could could point point us in the right direction? And you can dispel it all pretty easily. You know, but that's the best I can do. I'm afraid. Oh, no, 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 sorry, no, yeah, no, Craig, um, Craig, Craig. we we ran an event on the historicity of the resurrection with City Bible Forum years ago, and we got the Professor of Ancient History at Adelaide University to speak uh, against uh, belief in the resurrection and the historicity of it. Mm -hmm. He was really helpful and I had a few sort of catch-ups with him and copies and his, his main sort of, his concern actually with the general population is that they don't understand history and they don't have, uh, there's, there's not Generally in education now, there's not a valuing of history. Mm. And so people don't know history as such, mm. and they haven't actually had great exposure to being taught history mm. or um, looking into it. So that was his great distress. And he talked about that in terms of Adelaide Uni and the departments and where the funding goes and mm. how things, you know, and he said, and yet history is such an important thing for us just purely from the fact of understanding what we've done in the past so we build on that <coughs> in the future so i think you're dealing with that as well with people now yes yeah. are you going to do any future events with that guy yeah. uh he is he is under a lot of pressure <laughs> with a very diminished department so i have asked him to do something else but he was just too uh under the pump yeah as a but he has got a couple of young grads who are uh, his sort of, you know, um, great white hopes, who are, um, so one who is doing Roman history, and he was very good, and he came and did the, when we did Ben Hur, he basically did the um, historical background into, you know, the Roman period in which Ben Hur was set. Mm -hmm. sort of Just on that history thing, I read a book um, published by the BBC, and it's probably 30 years old now, mm -hmm. but. It was very good because it was a non, like you said, it yeah. wasn't written from the perspective because I was brought up in the Protestant tradition and I think Protestant history starts at Luther and yep. when Christ was died. Yeah. Yeah. And the, you, it's a huge gap other than the history I learned as a kid. And I had a bit better flow in that. But um, 
But this, this book was really good because it talks about all of these things. And uh, maybe even the, the video might still be available, I don't know. Yeah, so that's a good point. I mean, even in theological colleges, it often is the first 200 years. Yes. Then we kind of go silent. And then at 1500, you know, in the Reformation, we kind of pick it up again. And, That's right. and away we go. We've missed, you know, 12 or 1300 years. Yeah, survive for three, yeah, yeah, which is understandable given where yeah. we are and all the rest of it. But there's, there's a lot of richness in there. And I think that um, uh, Christians shouldn't be afraid to stand on the truth of history. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, if, if you're in a position where you're just trying to distort it or, or change it for your own, you know, I don't think that's going to help anybody. You know, so I, I think um, that's important because yeah. um, Christianity, is, important. Christianity is probably one of the few religions that's actually falsifiable. Mm. Yeah. Um, it would have been historically, it could still be historically falsifiable. Yeah. Um, but I, I, just to, to butt in, um, one of the things, uh, David here and I did a, a, um, a comparative uh, intro to world religions course, um, I don't know, 18 months or so ago. And they put us onto the uh, onto the uh, BBC History Channel for a lot of the religions. I just finished watching one, actually it was from PBS, but if you just go to YouTube, you have to be careful how to take Perry's uh, note of caution here, but for a really good intro, this person existed, they did this, they said that, uh, a, a good intro, um, a lot of the, the BBC history on Christianity, Islam, and we you see something on Islam that confirms something in Christianity, you go, oh, that's interesting. Um, so that might be a resource for a starting point. Yeah. Because it's impartial. All right, mm. uh, It's nine o'clock now.